in arts and culture program that focuses on agriculture in the regions of California and Mexico. Drawing inspiration from John Steinbeck's portrayal of the region as a corrupted Eden, the program questions ethical, cultural, and regional practices related to foodways and the venture from sea to table. The biblical reference of a land of milk and honey first became associated with California as a tool for promoting the state as a land of opportunity, a destination for those in search of a better way of life, a terra firma that would provide sustenance and abundance. And this boosterism also served as an ethos that fueled manifest destiny and resulted in land grabs, ecological destruction, and social injustices. Now, in addition, the concept draws broad historical threads between land-based narratives across the Californias, such as the Magonista Rebellion in Tijuana and Mexicali in 1911, Oki migration to California in the 1930s, the legacy of the Bracero program, and the movement for farm workers' rights that were led by the United Farm Workers, as well as allowing us to draw connections uh, between historical uh, movements and the consequences of today's global pandemic. So the exhibition invited artists to address the multi-layer topics associated with agriculture, and that included environmental impacts of industrial farming, cultural culinary traditions, identity and migration, and familial and mythical connections to food. And we encouraged artists to reflect on these issues during critical moments in history, as well as offer contemporary reimaginings of the agricultural pasts of California. So our virtual panel today features four artists whose works are representative of artistic strategies that have developed to critically engage history, culture, and community in California and Mexico. Now, the issues that they cover include, but are not limited to, borders and borderlands, colonial myths, the location and diffusion of knowledge, uh, as well as cross-cultural or cross-national dialogue. And so further, I just wanted to add that each artist has also activated different research processes in order to uncover and bring to light very difficult pasts, violent events, and erased histories. So joining us today are Jessica Wimley and Chris Christian, Narciso Martinez, and Emily C.D. And so we're going to begin by introducing uh, Jessica Wimbley and Chris Christian and inviting them to speak about their work. Um, and so I'll provide um, a brief biography. Um, Wimbley and Christian are both artists and curators based in Sacramento. In their artistic collaboration, they are interested in the framework of histography to reflect the relationship between human and natural history in California. Now they have an interdisciplinary artistic practice that includes working with video and digital installations and projections. And they're also curators uh, and have developed the project series Biomythography with exhibitions in academic and nonprofit art spaces in Southern California. Um, so Jessica and Chris, I will give the floor to you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, thank you for having us. Um, so just to get started, um, the collaborative piece that we um, have in the exhibition is a sequel of sorts to the Unauthorized Histography of California. Um, 
Um, the Authorized Histography of California, which is a appropriate video piece that explores the um, adherence to patriarchal models and how it affects race and nation and gender roles, um, particularly in California. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the fictional character of Queen uh, Calaf Calafia is used um, throughout the video and sort of serves as a mother, protector, and um, narrator throughout the video. And this is inspired actually the role by the um, Disney um, um, exhibition Golden Dreams, which is now closed, but it actually um, used Queen Califia as a model or narrator, taking people through the history of California and Queen Califia was played by Whoopi Goldberg. In histography, she's played by the lead protagonist in the 1966 film, Black Girl. Um, and in that film, it actually breaks kind of Eurocentric con conventions, providing the first African um, perspective and female perspective of the tense relationship between the formerly colonized and colonizer. Um, in histography, um, the character um, um, sort of serves jumping through as a narrator, following you through different parts of um, history and um, and the domestic violence and structural violence throughout the community of California, um, jumping from different time periods. Um, this kind of refers to the title histography and histography is actual interactive timeline and it is, it allows viewers to jump from a variety of events or target a specific event in a um, time search in relation to a specific category. So for example, you could move from, look at a past century in the categories of war and invention. And that sort of served as a framework for how um, the histography videos were crafted. All right. Um, and I was working on a project called Field Notes, uh, which were, which was a video that I made that actually was making reference to author and anthropologist work field works um, 19, that was done in 1928 by Zora Neale Hurston. And Zora Neale Hurston is very interested in the idea of capturing um, the life of Black people in the diaspora in the South um, and understanding what do these live experience, especially post-slavery um, during Jim Crow era in early American history, what were the experiences of um, African-Americans during this time? And so here you can see um, a still from uh, field works and field notes in which I'm taking on the different um, characters within the actual um, referencing the different characters in the original field works video. And what I'm doing is focusing and being hyper local on my own um, location. So I'm at my own home walking down my stairs, you're hearing me humming a work song that was sung throughout the field works um, original video by Zora Neale Hurston and taking on some of the gestures of um, the figure in the video. Um, when Chris and I st started working together, we actually did this video for the California Natural Resource Agency in Sacramento. So we're directly dealing um, with the land in that way. Um, and part of what we're interested in was looking at uh, California land history and looking at it through the lens of uh, within the framework of the California seal. 
and playing with the narrative that was actually in this seal and bringing some more information or deep diving in deeper um, into depths in terms of what is that actual story that the seal is telling. So within this, uh, you can see there's more collage and it's a multi-layered telling. You're seeing stories of people working um, with the land in different ways. And I'm taking on the persona of Califia. We also were looking at landscape through different um, state parks. We live very close to um, Sutter's Fort, which is um, one of the founding spots uh, during the gold rush. And we're also looking at Negro Bar State Park, um, which is a historic site uh, where African mine. African Americans were gold miners during um, the California gold rush. Um, since then, the name has actually changed to Black Miners Bar, but I think it's interesting to note that Negro Bar and that sign that you're seeing is all the information that you received about the history of Negro Bar. So the most information you get is from Negro. Um, and looking at uh, making volume two um, of the unauthorized history of California, we're taking that idea of field notes of collecting information in the field and looking hyper um, locally and again, expanding out. Um, and so looking at the California gold rush and its relationship to different types of rushes and migrations to California, um, which also include uh, the agricultural rush um, and the real estate rush. Growing up in the U.S., you learn about the California gold rush, the 49ers and their hunt for gold. But that's only part of the story. The truth is the gold rush was the start of one of the darkest periods in U.S. history. But this dark history remained covered up for years. So what actually happened? Germans, Belgians, French, Catholics, Presbyterians, Mormons. One of the world's great mass migrations begins. The pioneer spirit has moved on. In this colossal migration to Oregon and California, America will finally define its character. So that was a clip um, from the Historiography of California, Volume 2, Field Notes. And um, as I was saying before, the, one of the entry points was looking at the gold rush and how um, land was thought about and used during that time and expanding outward in terms of the timeline. And one of the things that you see throughout the film and you saw it towards the end were these symbols. And these symbols are actually in reference to um, what's believed to be symbols used around the time of the Underground Railroad to direct um, those escaping slavery to places of freedom, food, they were helping towards navigation um, and giving different symbols that led to safe spaces. Um, we also incorporate the symbol of um, the use of the flying geese. And flying geese also in that sense represent migra migration for both slaves and um, the geese flying towards the north. Um, something that you actually see in the quilt codes um, is the um, symbol of um, the geese and the flying geese that are represented by these um, triangles that you actually find also within origins of native culture, the Maori tribe who originally existed in the um, east, uh, eastward um, part of the Sacramento River. Um, so you're seeing kind of the um, reuse or this um, use of this um, these symbols by these different um, groups that um, also had these different kind of interactions with the goat miners that caused them to um, relocate and move and change how they were living. Um, now, there's a lot of devastation that came from, of course, the gold rush 
in what was done to the land. So the ecological disaster and how it in, impacted the indigenous community um, from the foods to the rivers where trout, a lot of trout was killed, a lot of fish, a lot of the local um, just ecosystem for game and growing and survival um, was destroyed. And that was a significant part of, of or a significant part of the repercussion of the gold rush. One thing that's very important to remember about this industrial enterprise of citrus is that it was built on the backs of an industrial labor force. Sunkist actually went out and hired an advertising agency to sell the California dream. And that whole advertising campaign today we look back on was instrumental, I think, in developing the state of California. One thing that's very important to remember about this. And so one of the things we're also talking about within the video is this idea of the agricultural gold, agricultural rush, another rush um, to California, another idea of migration to this milk and honey and gold and abundance of the natural resources that California has to offer. Um, and not just thinking about it as... Um, the connection between the labor, but also in terms of how you're seeing and constructing ideas about the land. And this also goes into then looking at how the land then is reconceived for just real estate. So real estate boom, and what that means for people relocating and migrating for the idea of the land being valuable for housing. And so um, in this um, particular clip, you literally have honey <laughs> um, dripping down um, as you have a seed of westward migration with realtor codes that are introducing ideas of who is allowed to live where and how do we make that happen. Which brings us to redlining and thinking about ideas of how our maps we've drawn. We've seen this in the creation of California with tons of uh, different land grants being offered between the US and Mexico, breaking up the land and giving the land to different people. And then we also see this in different ways with redlining when you're having the land cut up and segregated, valued or devalued, depending on who's living on that particular land. So these different relationships that you have people um, throughout different time in California to the land is constantly shifting. And in particularly looking in an African-American perspective, there's a constant migration and tension um, between the idea of when land, when there's land you can actually occupy and the idea of ownership is never really fulfilled or seen or understood. It's more of a regulating placement rather than um, looking at ideas of home. So I'm gonna stop here. Thank you so much. Jessica, yeah, thank you so much, Jessica and Chris. Um, I hope that you will all also kind of join me in maybe like reacting, um, you know, to yeah, giving a round of applause, like an emoji, uh, emoji claps, as we say, um, or yeah, sparklers. Um, if you have any questions um, for Jessica or Chris or for any of the other artists, please feel free to write your questions into the chat, um, or if you have any kind of comments, um, um, yeah, that you want to kind of address kind of during the talks, please feel, please feel free to do so. Um, so our next artist is Narciso Martinez. Um, Narciso, I'm going to read um, a short biography um, and then basically kind of give the floor to you, Narciso. Um, but Narciso's piece installation from the Unnumbered Portrait Series um, is currently on view at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. Um, Narciso was born in Oaxaca, Me in Oaxaca, Mexico. He migrated to the United States at the age of 20 and now currently lives and works in Long Beach. He holds an MFA from Cal State Long Beach, and he has also been the recipient of numerous awards, 
including the Daedalus Foundation MFA uh, Fellowship, the LA Emerging Artist Remo Hortman Foundation Grant, and the 2019 Stanley Hollander Award. Um, he has exhibited nationally and internationally, uh, including in South Korea, in Florida, in Chelsea, New York, um, and recently at Arte America in Fresno, California, at Craft Contemporary in LA, and at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC. And he actually recently um, had a fantastic uh, um, you know, review published in the New York Times that I think is incredibly exciting. So congratulations, Narciso. Thank you. Um... And thank you for inviting me. Uh, I I guess um, I'm gonna share my screen and just show uh, a few slides and just go through the story of my work as it relates to um, the exhibition, the Land of Milk and Honey. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Um, so I, I mean, I don't, I, I guess, sorry, I don't know how to start, but, <laughs> but um, I did, I actually did this piece when I was, um, when I was in school and doing the research for, um, for an art history class. And I was trying to fi find out uh, how much farm workers were depicted in in, in art during the 1930s and 40s. And I came across these illustrations that I saw from the previous um, uh, slideshow. And, and um, I just thought they were like beautiful images of people, animals, and um, kids even um, on, in these beautiful landscapes. Um, I, I guess, not I guess, but I, for I can remember these illustrations were trying to um, they were trying to uh, entice people to move to California. They were pretty much advertising California as the land of the bounty. And I saw images such as this on my right. I mean, yeah, on my, on my left, sorry. And, um, and as, as someone who was working in the fields um, at that time, and I was doing art and trying to figure it out what the theme of my, what my thesis was going to be for my graduation show, I thought of, I thought I could, Paired the two of those, um, paired the two of them, the illustration from these poster and the actual images of farm workers as I remember them. I mean, based on images that I took. But um, and so that's that's how this image on this on on the right uh, came to be. And while I was doing this uh, image of this nice looking lady, I just thought of all the risks that um, farm workers have to go through, like uh, the pesticides and and the um, and the harsh weather conditions, the heat and the cold. So I decided to turn this nice looking lady into a skeleton. Um, I, I, I think I was thinking about those uh, images that I see behind cargo trucks that indicate toxicity or something like that, but that's how it came about. And this other image um, was made in response to the to the negative comments that Trump was making while he was campaigning for presidency. I remember um, I was kind of frustrated and I didn't know how to respond to that. So I decided to to make a piece that would show the contribution of the of the Latino uh, to the country. And, you know, because I was working in the fields and I, I those images were around me. So I, I thought I could make an image of a farm worker sort of like presenting the 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 abundance of food uh, that um which is the product of their work and their contribution to the nation um the like the next image um it's a series of portraits that i did um i th i think i was i was thinking about how um how I guess I was thinking about how like 
whenever we see, I guess it's a cultural thing, whenever you see someone with a mask or, or a hoodie, we always tend to think that it's a bad person, that we should be afraid of it, of that person. But um, but it, but I, I feel like farm workers wear bandanas, goggles, or some kind of shades and hoodies to protect themselves from from the pesticides that are that are left in the orchards from the sun and the snow so i feel like they are afraid the ones that are afraid from all those conditions due to working in the fields um i i don't know i i when i and it's interesting because when i started printing these portraits um the reactions that i got from the first viewers were like why are you painting um gangsters or terrorists and it's because I was printing them on regular paper, but then I decided to print them on boxes so that I could add some con context to those portraits. Um, and it was a, a bunch of, because I was still in school, so I was still like debating which way I wanted to go. So I, I, print those, I printed those images in, in different um, surfaces. Um, I did a collage. I did collage with um, the labels of, of uh, from different uh, brands and boxes, and I printed the, printed these portraits on those collage, but it was for me it was kind of too colorful, so I printed them on this Duralar material, which is a little um, translucent, and you could see traces of the images uh, of the brands behind them, which are interrupted by the by the portraits. Um, I also printed them in uh, regular cardboard, which uh, I, I just included a sample of three here, but these are included in the um, in the exhibition the Lado Milk and Honey at the Santa Cruz uh, Museum of Art and History for the Mexicali Biennial. And I think um, one thing that I wanted to add to this is that um, unfortunately, uh, when farm workers work by the contract um, uh, under pressure, uh, either the bandana has to go or the goggles has to go because it's really hard to breathe um, with the bandana on. Uh, and sometimes if you keep the bandana then, and the goggles, um, the goggles get foggy because of the really fast breathing. So farmers get rid of their goggles, sometimes even both. It's, it's, um, it's kind of unfortunate that farm workers have to risk um, their health and sometimes their lives, you know, for, um, for a few extra buckets and, you know, to participate in the production of food for us. Um, this, this piece I did for the Long Beach Museum of Art, um, um, I wanted to introduce, again, the contribution of the Latinos to the economy. And I borrowed some of the patterns from the dollar bill um, for this piece. And, um, and the sub theme of it was um, abundance, right? And um, on the front part of the piece, I did this installation uh, where I painted a lot of Produce. I did. Um, I did paint uh, different kinds of apples and strawberries. I did, I painted blueberries and I can't remember which asparagus. I believe, but um, oh, oranges and tangerines. So I did. I put these paintings in in actual produce packagings, whether boxes or little plastic pack containers, and then I displayed them on the front. So the idea was to sort of like try to um, spark. Um, questioning like how do we have all these um this food right this every time i go to the grocery store it seems like i see bigger and, and shinier produce right uh, at the grocery store but we never I, at least i it's it's hard to think like where's this coming from and uh and and it's not easy to know like how how this produce came to be, you know, came to be so bigger, it's so shinier, and even different kinds of produce, like different, um, for lack of a better word, iteration of of those apples, right? And um, and someone, as someone that worked in the fields, like sort of like overseeing the the um, sort of sort of like overseeing the 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 chemicals uh, application of all these. Um, of all this produce, it's I, I just think that it's so weird that um we use chemicals to to produce food like from the very beginning right from from when the plants are planted a, a chemical is applied to it so it grows faster another type of chemical is applied to it so they can bear fruit and if the plant bears too much fruit another kind of chemical is applied so it drops some kind of fruit it's it's insane <laughs> it's crazy but I'm not an expert so I don't I don't know how 
that affects even our health, no? Or the land, really. Like, um, I don't know how the land will react, like in the future, maybe now, how the land is reacting. Or how would it react if those chemicals are, are not applied to it anymore? So, I don't know. That's a question that I think about, and maybe it requires uh, research, right? But I'm just an artist who does drawing. So, so here is an, um, a detail of that piece. Uh, you can see the farm workers in the back and just uh, and the produce sort of like in the front. Um, I don't know. This is sort of like the last. So this is like the last image. So uh, in this piece, I, I, when I was doing this piece, I was thinking about like um, my own experiences. Like I wanted to, I wanted to include in this piece as much experiences as, as I could. So I thought about like, like my, my growing up in, in Mexico, right? I'm like, it was said before I was, I, were, I, I grew up in, in Oaxaca in a small town. It was like a farming community. I remember my parents taking me to the fields and, um, and just help around. Um, and I, I think where I'm trying to go with this is that the, dif the differences between people plotting their lands in, in small communities in Oaxaca and, and people farming in the United States like I know that it's probably all over the the world now, but like growing up and the little knowledge that I had um, it, in Oaxaca, it was all for our own consumption. We would um, plant corn and beans, uh, pretty much, and we were at, at the mercy of the of the rain. If, if there was a good rain, we had a good crop. If it wasn't, then we had to struggle throughout the year. Um, and when I came here to the United States and I work in fields, uh, it's like the difference was so. So big, no, and and it was sort of like shocking um, that it's all for profit, and is and this is backed up by by my experiences working at a produce warehouse here in Los Angeles, where I had to sort um, fruit, sort things out, like sort fruits um, out, like whether it was good, it was sort of good, and it was bad, and um, I don't know. I I just think it's interesting that the that produce that i would that would end up in in the trash was stored for the longest time in the freezers and and just because of the money um i, I don't know how economics work but like just just the whole point is just money you know how because of money um i don't know if it was because it was too too cheap the owner would rather have those that produce thrown away than um than make some kind of money or at least donate the fruit so that it wouldn't go to waste. So anyways, um, this disparity, I guess, between money and food production is kind of crazy, but, um, but going back to the piece, I, um, I, I, I just think that now it's like, like I said, it was like worldwide now. And it seems like the farm workers are, I don't know, screwed up. I don't know if that's a correct word to say here, but like um, everywhere, it seems like the farm workers are oppressed. They are always struggling. They were the poorest people in their communities. Um, they don't have the same advantages. Like it seems like they are all uneducated for some reason. Um, I don't know. It's just it's just crazy. So I guess that's um, that's sort of like my connection between my experiences in in Mexico and my experiences here in the United States. And I don't know if this is connected, but um, but um, I titled this piece "Philosophy in the Fields" because I really wanted to encourage my my coworkers to go to school. Given that I we sort of have the same background, but um, but I for some reason I was able to you know to get the courage and go to school and have an education and learn how the system works so that I could um have a better life really you know because um that working in the field is really hard so there was always this like oh i'm too tired like i can't go to school it's too tired i'm too old but i will always encourage their kids they I encourage them to encourage their kids to go to school because i feel like having an education gives us um um give us a chance or gives it's like a tool to um to demand um better working conditions or better wages so so yeah i feel like um 
now with all these um, foreign policies, it's like crazy. I feel like, um, I guess as my last comment, um, I noticed that um, big corporations are taking over those small lands. And it's funny because, not funny, but like interesting how, like you mentioned John Steinbeck at the beginning. And if I can remember something from that, um, from John Steinbeck's um, The Great for Rat, there is a passage where, where the farmer tries to, tries to go back and get a hold of his land, but then the tractor driver says, I'm not responsible, I'm just a worker. So the farmer gets frustrated, right? And, and he realizes that is a, a bigger monster out there that is taking over his, uh, his, his land, which is agribusiness. And, um, and that's, I feel like that's what's happening now in different um, parts of the world, like with big companies taking over all these plots of land and like contaminating their, um, their land as well. So I don't know where this is going to go. And I feel like that was my last comment. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Narciso, for your wonderful talk. Um, again, I encourage everyone to give a round of emoji claps um, uh, to Narciso, or if you have any questions, um, please drop them in the chat. Um, so our last presenter, uh, and then we will break out into um, a group discussion, um, is Emily C.D. Uh, Emily is an artist, activist, and seed saver whose work aims to empower people, protect plants, and restore dignity to local and binational communities between the United States and Mexico. Um, Emily is originally from Maryland, but has established roots in Mexico uh, in the past decade. Um, and she's actually joining us now um, from Central Mexico. Uh, she has partnered with diverse peoples on both sides of the border um, to create works that will transform public spaces uh, with murals, installations, and community gardens. Um, and she's also the visual artist of the Somo Semilla Seed Library in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico. Uh, so Emily's Semillas para Todes, um, Seeds for Everyone, uh, is now on view at the um, Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. So Emily, I will, um, yeah, let's get the table on to you. Thank you, Rosalia, and hello. Thank you everyone for joining. I just wanna say I'm really excited to be presenting my work in the context of the work of Jessica, Chris, and Narciso, uh, because I think you know it's been very, very clear tonight from the presentations that art has a wonderful ability to make visible that which society wants to make invisible. And we've talked about the colonization of land and the way that workers who work the land are, you know, dealing with dangerous, unequal situations. And I think it's also important to, to dig deeper and realize that a lot of that has to do with the, the invisibility of the seeds. Um, we begin to understand that they're one of the most elemental reasons that modern day industrial agriculture is detrimental to the land and the people. So all of these images that I'm sharing are from my work as the visual voice of the Somo Semilla Seed Library here in San Miguel de Allende. Um, we're a collective of women who maintain a collection of open pollinated seeds that are gifted to local gardeners with the ask that they cultivate their plants in the most ecologically sustainable way possible. And that when those plants reach the end of their growing cycle, that a portion of the new generation of seeds are returned back to the library. So I just want to clarify that not all seeds are created equal, not all seeds are okay to save. I'm working with semillas criollas, those are native seeds or heirloom seeds in English. Uh, they originate from seeds that were selected from the wild and cultivated by our ancestors thousands of years ago and they've been passed down through the generations. So just as we humans hold within us genetic and cultural histories of our families who came before us, seeds also are historical repositories of genes and stories. And I specifically wanna bring up that native seeds uplift a repressed narrative that there can exist a positive relationship between people and nature. So the heirloom seeds that we have today, they exist because there's been this long tradition of cultural collaboration with the plant world. 
Uh, they're the result of innumerable generations of people selecting seed from plants with specific desired characteristics, such as the sweetest fruit, and then growing that seed out so that each successive generation of the plant expresses those chosen characteristics evermore. So this is a natural coevolution that relies on open and pollination and it is in no way related to corporately owned hybrid and genetically modified seeds which are artificially created and often with the goal that they are resistant to herbicides specifically glyphosate which is better known as roundup um you know they're a they're an integral part of the the industrial agriculture model that's very detrimental to the land and people so when we're safe when we save and share seeds heirloom seeds, um, we're participating in revolutionary work. So a seed library is like a modern seed saving model inspired by the shared economy of book libraries. It builds on an ancestral practice of saving seeds and exchanging them with community members. And Somosimia is part of an emerging global grassroots movement to put seeds and the knowledge of how to conserve them back into the hands of the people. Uh, I wanna clarify that seed libraries are community-based. They're quite different from seed banks, which tend to be institutional and where seeds are hermetically sealed and stored in freezers in preparation for the end of the world. <laughs> so those seeds are essentially asleep and seed library work I'm involved in is about keeping seeds alive and growing. And my goal as an artist within this movement is to amplify and celebrate seeds and the people who steward them. You know, seeds are so small that it's easy to forget about them. And as a global society that's moved from mostly rural to mostly urban, I don't feel like seeds occupy a big part in the popular imagination today. I really want to change that. I want people to notice seeds, notice how beautiful they are. They're colorful. They have these incredibly textures and forms. And it's important that we remember what their significance is. You know, especially as modern agriculture is moving from farther and farther away from its traditional roots. Um, seeds might seem insignificant, but they're actually like one of the most fundamental elements of our human existence. They're the beginnings of the plants that feed us, that clothe us, um, that are the materials that build our homes. So everything is, you know, so, so much of everything we need is coming from seeds. And, you know, having seed libraries help to confront this current trend of monoculture. And when we save seeds from regional varieties of crops and other plants, we're participating in the preservation of biodiversity and cultural heritage. So seed saving isn't hard, but it does require some basic knowledge that has been mostly forgotten in modern society. So in 2017, Somos Semilla decided to create and self-publish Cultiva Cosecha Comparte, Semillas Para Todes, which is Grow, Harvest, Share Seeds for Everyone in English. And because we were really frustrated, there weren't there was hardly any illustrated seed saving manu manuals or educational information in, in, in Espanol, in Spanish. Like every single thing was in English. So I did all of the illustration and design and I really focused on creating imagery that's bright and bold in order to spark people's curiosity in the book and the information that it contains. And it's been really exciting for me because it, the creating this manual was educational even for me and I acquired all the seed saving knowledge and credibility and now I find myself a part of a vibrant community of seed people. So right now in the land of milk and honey, I am exhibiting the original paintings that you see here in this book. Um, this was my first foray into the world of botanical illustration. And I learned a lot just from meticulously observing the plants. Each painting shows a full cycle of each plant from seed to seed and encompasses the diversity of the varieties of each crop. So sharing this art and using it to inspire and educate has been about giving people tools to better understand and collaborate with seeds and the cycles that sustain us. And I think it's really empowering to participate in the cultivation of your own food. You know, even if it's just like one tomato plant, um, and if you're able to do so without depending on the capitalist system for your seeds, it's even better. You know, this work is about honoring seeds and seed guardians, but it's also about demonstrating the viability of alternative economies where resources are not commodified, but they're actually shared within communities. Seeds themselves are generous. Uh, a single seed that's 
that's planted and well cared for will produce a plant that will give you back tens, hundreds, or thousands more seeds. And, you know, I also, you know, I want to, you know, make a big point saying like, I'm talking again about native seeds, heirloom seeds, because GMO seeds and hybrid seeds do not, they don't give back in the same way. It's either impossible, you're gonna get a plant that's nothing like the plant that gave you the seeds, or you're gonna get sued by a multinational corporation for using their patented seeds. So watch out. <laughs> um, it's, you know, in this current agriculture climate, it's like been really uplifting to see that there's been a real positive response to the book that we created. Um, and I've been particularly moved to notice how meaningful our work has been for young people, particularly um, young people here in Mexico who are studying agroecology. So I just continue to build upon what we began with the seed saving manual, um, using art to uplift the seed narrative. And so right now my current installation at the MA includes the original paintings from the manual together with a copy of the book to give the paintings context and a new work, which is an ephemeral mandala made from actual seeds on a cotton canvas and agave fiber rope ground. Um, these are the calculations that my dad helped me figure out because I needed to know exactly how big the spaces in the design were because my idea was the source of seeds from local seed savers and I wanted to be able to tell them exactly how much I was gonna need. So I just wanna say thank you so much to the Demeter Seed Library and Pie Ranch um, who responded with so much enthusiasm when I reached out to them about lending me seeds for my installation. Demeter Seed Library of UC Santa Cruz is a student run nonprofit organization of local farmers and gardeners who believe in the importance of preserving the genetic heritage of our food. The library maintains a large inventory of heirloom and native seed varieties that prosper in Santa Cruz's climate through grow out collaborations with local organic farms and seeds are distributed freely to all. Pie Ranch is a nonprofit organization and organic production farm with a mission to cultivate a healthy and just food system from seed to table through food education, farmer training and regional partnerships. It's their goal to change the food system and grow healthy, resilient communities through sustainable agriculture, education, advocacy, and training. So when you realize that from my home in Mexico, I was able to coordinate the borrowing of all of these seeds all the way up in Santa Cruz, you begin to understand how amazing the seed network it is. You know, it's beautiful, it's resilient, and it's like, there's like a lot of love and generosity. So for me that this design um, of interlocking circles really, really exemplifies that spirit. Um, it's an ancient geometric symbol that's been used in diverse cultures around the world to visually represent the interconnectedness of life. I felt like it was an ideal form in which to place corn, bean, and squash seeds because these three crops complement each other, both in the milpa, which is the traditional interplanted field, and also nutritionally on our plates. And the human plant interaction is also integral to the success of their cultivation. And of course, the collaborative nature of my artistic process for the creation of this work is, is parallel in the design. So I actually never really doubted that um, seed savers in California would lend me, even though I'm a perfect stranger, that they would lend me their seeds because you know my involvement in Somo Semia and the, and the creation of our manual, I feel like it, it, it would help that I be perceived in, as inherently trustworthy basically because I'm a part of the seed community. And at its essence, the seed sovereignty movement is imbued with a spirit of generosity because it's grounded in the idea of free exchange of seeds among growers and the open sharing of the knowledge of their conservation. The land of milk and honey has been a fascinating space to present the invaluable grassroots work of seed libraries in Mexico and California. It's been a fantastic opportunity to weave a more resilient web of seed support that stretches across the border that tries to divide us. So working with seeds has been a really inspiring journey for me. And I'm really fortunate that my artistic research brings me into direct contact um, with fascinating seed people whose experiences and knowledge directly inform my artwork. And I just really loved the process of creating this piece, the research to find the seed savers, um, the community outreach, to ask them to lend me their seeds, 
the transnational collaboration that was required to ensure their arrival at the museum. It was all like very complex and I was like very excited by all of it um, because I was just interacting with so many interesting and generous people. And, you know, when I finally like had the seeds in my hands, it was just this amazing feeling of, wow, that, you know, so many people and, you know, like the collaboration even of nature to get these seeds into my hands so that I can create this work of art. I just like felt overwhelmed with with gratefulness. So my sea artwork is actually part of a, a larger body of artistic production that explores and challenges our human interaction with nature. Um, I'm using different materials. I'm working across disciplines. And it's all in order to investigate the tension between social and environmental issues. Um, but whether I'm working with seeds or soil or plastic or paper, and often with many people, um, Ultimately, I'm trying to cultivate wonder and respect for our living world so that we might begin to redefine our relationships within the web of life. So thank you very much for, for joining us today for this important conversation. Thank you so much, Emily. That was absolutely wonderful. So um, that, uh, and let's give Emily a round of emoji claps, um, as well as if you have any questions, comments, um, please drop them in the chat. Um, so I am going to, uh, if, if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to raise your hand um, and then uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question to any of our um, artist presenters today. All right, awesome. So I guess, yeah, I'll get us started. Um, I have a million questions, um, but one question that seems to be, um, you know, kind of really kind of like sticking out in my head right now is to kind of perhaps ask you all to reflect a bit about the kind of boundaries between uh, subjective and objective forms of historical knowledge, um, you know, that ultimately kind of shape you know, come to shape histories, right? And how you balance the two in your work, right? And so, you know, or or is it a balance, right? Or do you use one to circumvent uh, the other? And so, for example, I was thinking, Jessica um, and Chris, about how your embodiment of this trans-historical mythical figure allows you to cut through a lot of the archival footage and image that we find in institutionalized um, kind of centers, right, for, for history, like archives, right, or libraries. And then Narciso, um, as you were speaking, I was absolutely delighted um, because you're, I think you're a, a budding art historian, and I didn't know that um, so much about your work. Um, you know, I think you're an art historical thinker. And so I was wondering about how your personal experiences in the fields, right, kind of also serve as fuel for cutting through some of the kind of the the, the cannot like the the canon of art history, right? So you know when I was looking at your work, I mean I see Diego Rivera um, and the agrarian landscapes of the 1920s, the social realism of the 1930s with you know the, the Thomas Hart Benton, but also um, and this might be kind of surprising, I also see the the neo impressionists um, in your work. Um, specifically, you know, Pissarro and the idealization of the um, the the pickers, right? Um, you know, kind of in yeah, in the late nineteenth century. Um, and Emily, I was thinking about how your personal experiences with uh, kind of with community organizing um, and collaborating kind of helps uplift seed libraries, right? Kind of challenge seed banks. Um, but also build up that see the seed sovereignty movement. So you know the kind of question is is you know ultimately if you can re just reflect a little bit about how your personal experiences, right? What is the what is the relationship with, between the personal um, and the you know kind of you know the obje objective right um, objective histories. Hello. So I um, thought I'd go ahead and take a stab at your question there. Um, I think what's been interesting 
in thinking about my own personal experience. And I think especially for both Chris and I, having relocated from Southern California, from Southern California to Northern California um, is another type of migration story um, that we're experiencing living um, in Northern California now. And I think also the relation, the context of where we live. So we live in Midtown. And I had mentioned before, we live like a few blocks from Sutter Fort. So it's like we physically are in the mix of where the gold rush started um, geographically. So part of it too has been about how we're learning about and discovering this new city um, that we're living in and uncovering some of the history that's displayed in plain sight. Um, and it's been interesting in that for Sutter, for example, this is a place that was recreated. Um, it's it, There's reenactments that happen there. So there's performance elements in terms of how that history is told. Right next to it is um, the Indian California Indian Museum. So you have these geographical, historical, um, social tensions existing in real time in the same space telling different histories. Um, and so I found that really fascinating in terms of being in Sacramento, seeing the, the juxtaposition of these two spaces and being in such close proximity and starting to look a little further into the history of the region. Um, I, I find it so fascinating how y'all are talking about seed banks and farming um, because Sacramento is like a farm to fork city. That's what we sell ourselves as in terms of um, as a city. And there is, it's a really rich area of different resources. So it's like you have um, wineries, you have farms, uh, you have historical places of the gold rush. You have, you have all these, the land is full of so much history um, where you start tracing different parts of it. And again, the state parks, because Sutter's a park, because Negro Bar is a park, these are public spaces that it allowed a place of entry to start physically to go and investigate these spaces and think about where you're at in relation to the history um, in real time and then playing with the temporal. Sort of locate yourself. Yeah. yeah. How do you locate yourself throughout the different times in history um, geographically? And I think for me, I think there's a, you know, um, just quickly, there's something specific about moving to someplace new and trying to physically kind of locate yourself in the space, but also locate yourself in terms of, okay, where did people who look like me experience here and what was the history there? And so when you kind of stumble across a place called Negro Bar, it's hard not to you know, be encouraged to find out more and, and figure out what the history of that was, which takes you in the history of something else. And it's just this kind of rich history to continue to explore. You fall down a hole. Yeah. That's pretty amazing, so. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Narciso, Emily, do you? I'll go ahead. I, I'll be honest, I don't know if I fully understand the question, Rosalia, but I'm, I guess where my mind goes with what you're asking is, you know, through my personal experience of being able to actually, you know, talk to farmers, um, I'm, and, you know, just like really engage with these people who are like way deeper into the seed world than I am. Um, Cause I'm, you know, I'm always coming at this work as an artist, you know, like, yes, I have a garden and I have some plants outside because I'm into that, but you know, like I'm not, producing on the level that like people who are farm workers are. Um, so, and you know, what I've learned through them is that like most of the incredible biodiversity that's existed in the native heritage seed stock has been eliminated because of big agriculture that's come in and just like 
just wiped it, wiped it all out. And it's, you know, like that's not, I mean, you can go online and, and Google it and find some pretty awesome like infographics that will make you feel really sad when you look at them. <laughs> but it's not something that's talked about a lot. You know, it's like, like seed dialogue isn't really like on the national news, but it's, it's, it's big because it's the, you know, like the first input in our food chain. So uh, it just, I guess it's interesting to, to interact with history in the moment um, and learn what's really going on by, but by just expanding like your, your, your network of where you're getting your information from. And just really, you know, I think all of us are building history and writing history. Um, it's just that some of us, according to society, have like more right to do so. So I think it's really important to um, be really inquisitive and talk to people. Yeah, you absolutely answered my question, Emily. Thank you so much. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so Narciso, um, yeah, would you like to respond or perhaps? Yeah. Others? Well, I, I would just, the thing that came to mind was um, that follow, I guess, your comment about Diego Rivera and how historically, whenever I, well, whenever I read uh, art, when I was in art history and I, I thought I, I, I thought I saw myself in his paintings because of representation. And and when I was doing actually that research paper, I mentioned about how much farm workers were included in art in the 30s and 40s. It turns out that there was not many, of, there was nothing. There was photographs, there was paintings, but it was all about the landscapes and and and, uh, and mostly um, the, the orchards and, and close up of fruits and, and vegetables. and uh, And, and it's it's so interesting because when I saw this image uh, of Diego Rivera, uh, I, I hope I can. I was trying to find out the name of the, the painting, but um, actually it's a mural. But, but um, I, I'll try to remember. I, I believe it's called. Um, it's either almond trees, almond trees with blossomings or blossoming almond trees or something like that. But it's a mural that he did when he came to uh, to Los Angeles in the, the, the 1930s and. He made in in for a for a private house in Malibu, I believe. But um, when I saw that painting, I was like, "Oh, there is some uh, representation of farm workers in art." And then, um, and I actually was sort of like questioning how how the the painting was um, was pretty neat. Like the the farm workers are not dirty, like the, the landscape seems neat and clean. There's no dust, even though there's a tractor passing by or something like that. And um, they, their clothes seems pressed and everything. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, I mean, I can criticize, as much as I can criticize, criticize this painting, at least there's some representations of it. But now that with the, uh, at the exhibition of um, Diego Rivera's America at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, I saw again the painting and, and all these different kinds of questions came out. And it turns out that they're, the subjects are not even, I mean, it seems like they aren't even like Latinos they, or farm workers. Like, it seems like there is, um, there is this, um, I don't know, it seems like intentionally trying to represent farm workers, but not really farm workers. You know, like, I don't know if I'm making myself clear, but like, I feel like when I saw farm workers, in those paintings, I was like, okay, Latino populations are representing, but now it's, it seems like there's all white folks um, working in the land, um, which according to my experience, I, I've never seen a white person working in the land, so uh, working in the fields. So I, I think it's interesting, this um, idea of, of what do you frame it as like, so objective history versus subjective history. So, um, so I don't know, I don't know where I'm going with this or if I already answered your question, but it's just so interesting Definitely. how, something that I actually experienced it right in the fields mm -hmm. and like how someone who managed to understand how everything works so that it can be questioned mm -hmm. it's it's so interesting you know and if if I wouldn't have gone to school if I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been able to talk about these things and and question that I don't know it's just it's just interesting no yeah that's absolutely fascinating um thank you so much yeah this is yeah this is this is right up my alley, at least, you know, as a <laughs> historian of modern Mexico. Mm. Um, uh, so do we have any questions from the audience? We can take one question. Enid. 
I'm just wondering about um, what the artists are working on, what they're excited about that they're doing next. What's what's new? What's next? I guess since I'm already unmute, I can answer part of that question. Um, well, I'm 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 in the studio and I have a piece that um, that shows a farm worker on. It's an elongated piece, like a vertical kind of piece, and whenever I work, I just I just think about the illustration on the boxes and what can be in conversation with. So I have these arranged arranged uh, mental boxes where the sort of like the center box has a box with a brand called Hollywood and Vine. And this has like little tiny the iconic uh, lights sort of like painted. And what I did is I extended the lights all the way throughout the background. And on the center, there's a farm worker. Sort of like posing on like a contraposto kind of pose. And she's holding um, a water container that is ready to go work in the fields. And underneath, I needed something to anchor the piece with. So I painted this uh, star, right? Because I think of Hollywood and I think of stars and glamour. So I painted this star and I painted it black. And it's that's also serves as a shadow of the figure. And he's just standing on it, just looking at the viewer. And on the glasses, the reflection of the glasses, I almost didn't do it because it was very difficult for me to draw it very tiny, but I did draw like scenes of people at a dinner table having some fruits. That's my project. <laughs> okay, I'll go, I unmuted first. <laughs> um, I am working right now like the, the the land of milk and honey is moving next to the Cheech and I'm going to be showing there as well. And so I'm right now like in the process of networking and connecting with seed savers in Riverside. And I get really, really excited about doing that kind of thing. I actually think one of them logged on Arlie Montavo. She's with the California Native Plant Society. And it's just, it's been interesting, like how it's transforming. Like, I don't think I'm going to be using milpa seeds there. I'm going to be using native plant seeds there. And so I'm like, doing all this thinking about, you know, like, well, the cultivated seeds we have today come from plants that were at one point wild. And like, what is that interaction and tension between wild plants and cultivated plants? And I'm just getting really excited about it and thinking like, how can I expand on this and like do lots of crazy geometric paintings with seeds with people all over the world. So <laughs> I'm kind of in that mode right now of planning and dreaming. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think we've, we've been, um, at least collaboratively, um, as Jessica said, we've, we've fallen down a rabbit hole. So we're kind of continuing down our, our rabbit hole of research and looking at um, um, deeper into kind of the areas that we're around, um, checking out the libraries here, which are amazing, um, and um, looking at um what is the um one of the kind of founders of, of sort of the places that we've been looking at who um held the actual land deeds to it so so yeah so um doing more research uh negro bar has actually the name has been changed to black miners bar that changed back in june so that's very that's fairly recent and so we've been looking at and doing more research and visiting um, different sites. Some of this does feel like national treasure where you're going on hunts to find different land markers. You're looking at old land grant maps and looking on Google maps and trying to find where these different places are. Um, and again, the resources that are nearby because we're in the state capital. Um, so now that the libraries have opened and um, you can access them, there's tons of interesting information and research to be had because we have the California State uh, History Museum that or History Museum as well as library um, that's here. So part of that mining, I, I, I find it funny talking about so much mining and layers where I'm like, well, I actually had to go mine these resources that are all layered um, <laughs> locally. 
um, and really kind of engage, engage and learn more about the history. Because again, some things are are hidden in plain sight. Yeah. And you're like, oh, snap. I, I think of it as historical tea. Um, so I'm just trying to learn more and more about the historical tea and make the connections. Yeah. I love that historical tea. Uh, I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna use that to say Congress. Right on. Awesome. All right. Well, um, I guess on behalf of the Mexicali Biennial, I want to say thank you to our artist presenters. Um, congratulations. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work with us today. Um, and again, thank you so much, Everett, um, and everyone at Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History. Um, if you haven't checked out The Land of Milk and Honey, um, you have until December 31st. Thank you so much to everyone who presented this evening and everyone who made time to join us. Um, also, this video will be available um, on the exhibition website. So um, keep an eye out for that if you'd like to share it with your friends and have a beautiful evening. Thank you so much.